we are live. Greetings, 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 and welcome to Heal Talk, Real Talk Tuesdays with Lisa. But today is not Tuesday, today is Thursday. And today is a special edition that I have for all of us. So for all of you who are live right here on Facebook, I thank you for joining us. Um, I have a special guest today. And my special guest is none other than Ty Hunter Jr. Um, welcome, Ty. Hello, Lisa. How are you doing? Hi. So allow me to introduce it just a bit. Uh, Ty is, um, I've known Ty for, oh my God. Let's not go back to the memory lane because we're going to be visiting that. Ty, uh, Ty Hunter is a retired Glendale police officer and also father of three and bodyguard to many dignitaries and celebrities. So I've had the uh, fortune, the good fortune of knowing you since, my God, before during teen times when we were in high school and you were sitting right behind me with your afro and every time <laughs> something would happen you would just tap me with your pen <laughs> <laughs> so welcome um and for all our viewers i would like you to start us uh, in memory lane how you got to be in glendale where you come from so let's do this ty it's the, the venue is yours. Please take over. Well, uh, I come from Detroit, Michigan, and uh, the earliest starts uh, my as a child was uh, I guess you could say Jefferson Project. So that's where I got my earliest start. Uh, my dad was a, a, a northern soul singer, I guess you'd say, and also a Motown artist. So I, was, mm. I guess you'd call me a Motown brat. And so. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we were over there and we were uh, doing our thing in, in Detroit for a minute and then Motown Records ended up moving out to uh, uh, California there in Hollywood on Sunset. And basically you had to move out there or you lose your contract. I believe that was uh, how it went down. So everybody decided to move out there, there to California and I think it was a good move. So after that, I, I started attending with Glendale High School and all that stuff. And that's where I met you. Yes. And, uh, you know what I mean? So <laughs> you were a bodyguard even then. I remember when something happened in that class. We were walking out of the class and someone bumped into me and you were right behind me. And I don't know uh, if you remember this or not. And you looked at that the guy and his name was Pete. I, I won't forget it because you bumped into him and he looked and you said, Hey, bump is a bump. <laughs> <laughs> It must have been my protective nature, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me. <that. laughs> so. Yes. So after high school, what happened? You remained in Glendale, right? Exactly. Okay. So, you know, I started uh, working in the, the music industry for a little bit. Uh, did a little bit of producing for A&M Records and such. Uh, wow. did that for Yeah, did that for a little while. But also, I need to get the paychecks going. So, um, we had also had a kid coming, you know, I was a first time dad, stuff like that. So, I ended up uh, uh, getting uh, hooked up into the Glendale Police Department and uh, became a sworn officer for the city of Glendale. And that was, that was what, 1980s? 90, no, well, 1991. Yeah, that's right. 19, 1991. Wasn't yeah, that yeah. okay? All right, that's a that's a twenty five years ago. Yeah, exactly. Well, a little bit Actually, more than, more that, than yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah How many year. years has it been uh, that you have retired? Uh, been five years, exactly. Already. Yeah. Okay. Well, I remember seeing you all the time in your black and white and everything. <laughs> Those are some good years, man. <laughs> exactly. So how was growing up having a father from Motown and being in Glendale? Were you like a celebrity son? No, is that no. how they knew you? <laughs> well, in Detroit, it was a little bit different because, you know, 
they were like on the scene, the music scene. So I remember being as a kid, yeah, people knew that, you know, my dad sang with the originals or, you know, when I was mm. younger that, you know, he was like a, like a soul singer and stuff like that. So I guess I got a little props, but when it came out to California and you know, I was just one of the kids. So, but, you know, I was still proud of my father. Of course. Exactly. Of course. Um, so you have a gorgeous daughter. And uh, I know uh, your sons you. and I've been following you. Well, because of we are friends and everything, they are thriving and you have done wonderful. Uh, knowing that you, you were a police officer, you still have a golden heart, man. You had a golden heart then and you still do. But yes. <laughs> so one of the things I want to... Um, for us, we got together is because we started uh, texting and messaging one another with everything that is happening. And this is why we, I wanted you to come on for our viewers, for everyone. I think just like any relationship in life, uh, the best relationships either at home, at work, uh, as a married couple or not, is having a dialogue and a communication where both parties are heard. Mm. What is going on right now, in your opinion, not only as a former police officer, but as a, uh, a black man in a community where all this is happening? It's, it's just a continuum. I don't even know how to describe it. I, my earliest uh, uh, memory of racism was probably like five years old, I think. And uh, I remember sitting on my uh, grandmother and uh, by the way, I'm biracial. I have a white mother mm -hmm. and a black father and I'm a police officer. So <laughs> I mean, you have it all. You have all, all three exactly. categories. <laughs> but yeah, getting back to the point, my earliest uh, memory of racism was sitting on my grandmother's lap. And again, my white grandmother, and uh, she's looking at me and she kept telling me, you know, you're, you're so special. You're my special boy. You're my special boy. And then she goes, uh, I, and then she said something to the fact, like, I can't believe those people actually, you know, did that. And I was looking up at her and she's like, yeah. And she goes, a long time ago, you know, when you, she said, she basically told me, I guess the day that I came home from the hospital, uh, the, the very next day, I, it was a small town up in the thumb area of Michigan, all white farmers and stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. No black people up there. Barely. So I'm like the first black kid that was born in this town. <laughs> so uh, a bunch of people from the town showed up at the doorstep and, uh, and knocked on the door and she's got me in her arms and stuff, she said. And uh, the guy, I guess the leader of the group says to her, you know, uh, you know her name was Thelma, like Thelma, we, we want to see the boy. And you know, she says, well, what do you want to see him for? And she says, uh, we want you to pull his diaper down. And she's like, you know, when, being my grandma, she says, you know, well, what the hell do you want him to, me to pull his diaper down to see his, you know, bottom? She goes, well, uh, we heard they're born with tails and that they have to cut off their tails. Okay. Yeah. At the time of birth. And we want to see if they cut off his tail. So I remember that. That was the first uh, thing, a, a memory of racism at five years old with my grandmother. And it just kept going. So um, I'm just one of those persons and like, you know, I don't try to attract that sort of thing, but it's just uh, the way I live my life. I don't, you know, I don't live my head down. You know, I've always walked with my head up. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that might affect people adversely being a black man, being biracial, whatever type of black man. Uh, people look at that in a, in a way of being uppity, uh, I guess you would call it uh, that type of thing. And so that's just, you know, that's just the person I am. But that was like my first uh, memory of racism. And then, you know, it just kept uh, progressing. I mean, I've been, I remember in high school, we went to high school together and such. And uh, I had, uh, you know, my girlfriends and stuff like that. And I think it was in the junior year, you know, I met this girl. And it turns out, you know, um, her, I called her up one day and her dad, you know, gets on the phone, you know, who are you? And I, as soon as I said my name, Tyrone, he's like, Tyrone, don't you ever in your life call this house again? And he mm. asked for my daughter type thing. So 
you know, that happened. Then the very next year, I was uh, seeing somebody, and uh, I, the same thing happened basically. I, had a, I got a call from a father who was like a prominent member of uh, like a Los Angeles County and, uh, you know, the high end type stuff business. And uh, basically, nice guy, but he told me, he goes, Tyrone, he goes, you know, my daughter wouldn't date anybody that wouldn't be a quality man. I know that for a fact. But for the reasons of, you know, his wife, I said, I, you can't see my daughter anymore. So it's just for me, like I said, it's been on a continuum. So I've been spit on, you know, uh, I've been attacked because of, like I said, I'm biracial. So I can imagine what the real brothers are going through. You know what I mean? So uh, it's just, uh, I, I can't explain why the hate keeps going on, but I guess, you know, there's something about us that must be so special that we keep getting the eye and the attention of all the people of the world because I mean, you know, I've been in different places and, uh, you know, yeah, you experience racism, but to the degree that we have here in, in the United States, uh, it's literally led me to the point where I want to sell my house and move at point. So it's sad to see it, you know, but hopefully it will get better. Okay. So how can, because right now what is happening and, you know, as a matter of fact, when I posted that I'm going to have, uh, you on as my guest, I had a message that it, uh, I got and the message was, uh, if you are about heal within and healing everyone, um, and as a hypnotherapist, stress management consultant, why do you have a police officer? And I'm like, really? Because this is about healing within. How can we cross a bridge or come to a, in the middle of a bridge to have this of how can we heal within? That's why um, my message is always about you matter and the affirmations about I matter. So the I, which is the me plus, and if we turn the me backwards, it becomes a W. So the me in wholeness is a we. And in there was only one God. When we are screaming either in joy or in pain, we're calling upon one God. So um, as a humanity, how can we come up with a dialogue to start healing within? Because there is so much segregation, um, not all whites are racists, not all cops are pigs, and I have many friends who are in the department. Um, but at the same time, I've learned one thing, that if I were to do wrong, and a police officer comes, at that moment, he's more of a police officer than a friend. Isn't that true? Very true. Okay. So it doesn't see color, it doesn't see friendship. It sees the uniform we are, you are wearing, not we, we, you are wearing. And what happened when you were a police, the uh, police officer, and you saw someone making, a, uh, when you were doing an arrest, and how were you accepted in the department, especially in Glendale at that time? I, too many questions put, at the same time. No, no, okay. no, 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 it, it, it's okay. Um, how do I put this? I was uh, very extremely fortunate to become a police officer for the city of Glendale. I mean, yes. uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's one of the uh, prestigious, most prestigious agencies in the United States of California. Always had one of the safest cities in the United States of California. Yes. Getting on that agency was very tough. It didn't, it didn't take me one time took me two times to going off through the battery and all that stuff. So I just mm. want to first acknowledge that, you know, I'm grateful for the job. But when I got on there. You have a great department. Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I was one of the early on guys, you know, uh, not too early on, but I guess I might've been like the sixth or seventh uh, a black officer that the city of Glendale had on there. And, uh, it, you know, I ran into some issues with racism and stuff like that along the way. And, uh, you know, it wasn't the, 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 uh, the things that I wanted to experience, but, you know, like I said, the things that happened that, you know, I, I thought were inappropriate and stuff like that. So 
I tried what, what I did while I was there, uh, while I was experiencing that. I, um, how do you put it? I, I was mad about it, but the thing that I, I, I did is I, I basically told myself, like Tyrone, you know, make sure that nobody ever sees you as a lazy person, mm. you know, and uh, make sure that, you know, nobody does see you as like a coward, you know. So, you know, this is police things. And, uh, and I, for me, I just took it personal. And I said, I want to be the best police officer that I can be. And that's exactly what I did. So I, I kind of put the pedal to the metal. And I wanted to make sure that, you know, there was no dirt on my name uh, as far as, you know, like I said, doing police work. And how can we come to a dialogue of understanding what is going on with the, all the riots that it's happening? Because, you know, it, it, it's there's so much of the media is playing also a very big role in heightening what is happening. The things that we need to see, maybe not everything that we need to see. So can you shed a light? It's sad. It's, it, it's pent up tension. Um, uh, I, 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 I was, uh, what, six years old, six years old when, uh, my dad took me and uh, sat me in the back of our, uh, Ford Fairlane and he literally drove me down to the, uh, 1967 Detroit riots. So that was like, you know, a major riot. You know I mean? That's like a major black uprising. It just had enough. And I remember sitting in the back of that, uh, Car and you know, looking at the flames out the you know the window and just you know my eyes wide open and stuff, and uh, you know again I'm a biracial uh, African American. I'm a police officer. I got both sides and stuff like that. But with uh, what's been going on on the continuum with the law enforcement officers uh, taking the lives of unarmed uh, black citizens, tension has built up to the boiling point. And not only with black uh, citizens, also with, you know, citizens of all, you know, ethnicities. And that's hence we got the riots and, you know, the greatest form of demonstration and the greatest form of change has come about by rebellion, you know, early on the Boston Tea Party and things like that. People look at uh, these uh, riots and such that are going on as, you know, uh, savages and, and thieves and hoodlums and looters and stuff like that. But the thing, the reason why they say that now is because these people who are rebelling don't look like them. See what I'm saying? I mean, people, there is even a talk that there are so many of them being paid to be there to do the looting and everything. That's another thing that's going on. I mean, it appears that, you know, and I don't, I'm no expert. I'm just going on what I see just like everybody else. But right. there is, appears to be a large faction of uh, these imposters, so to speak, that are there to be, you know, the persons that are doing the vandalism and, you know, doing the spray painting. So if you're, you know, you're down there on, uh, say, um, uh, Melrose, okay, and you see that there's this large crowd of uh, people of different ethnicities, and yeah, maybe there's a lot of black people because, you know, black men aside, and then you decide, you know, because I'm, I'm part of this pocket that's going to come down there, we're going to start smashing the windows of all these little boutiques lounge, you know, uh, shops and stuff Jewelry like that. Jewelry stores, boutiques, yeah. everything. I mean, yeah. And you're and you're a kid from the hood, okay? And maybe you don't have any money, maybe mom or something like that, some food stamps and stuff like that. You look over, your moral side says, you know what? I, I'm supposed to be at church, not doing the right thing, but you know what? That new Nike outfit or whatever, it's just a hop, skip, and a jump away. Mm. They hop through that window and they do the thing. It's impulse, you know what I mean? So. It's all this stuff. It, it's sad to see it. I don't want to see it. There's no purpose for it. But I also understand why it's happening. People are fed up. And, uh, but the, on, the, on the other hand, you see innocent officers being, uh, you know, brutalized and even killed and stuff. I mean, it's, I heard of a guy, I guess he was ran over with the ATV. Another yes. guy was ran over with the car. Uh, yeah. Officers shot, you know, a 70, 70 something year old open yes. uh, federal agent was shot. You know, that side of me says that's absolutely ridiculous and uncalled for. We don't know if those are black citizens that did that, but, you know, irregardless, it's uncalled for and it hurts to see all of this going on right now. Yeah, because what the media is uh, showing is, you know, uh, being a stress management, anger management consultant is first and foremost, how do we calm people up? But just like a volcano, 
that erupts, it cannot be calmed until it oozes the entire thing out. I mean, if we go all the way to history from Rosa Parks, that she would not want, she did not want to give up her seat. And because it was her seat. And to where nowadays we can get on a bus and we don't have to stand up for someone else unless you choose to, either for someone who's a senior or someone who's pregnant or, uh, I mean, it's called courtesy now. It's called courtesy and respect. But what we are seeing is like courtesy and respect is literally gone out and we are not, no one is being heard for the right, for the right message. That's, I think that's where we are all confused. It's like, we forgot all about the guy who died. And I mean, if we go back to what happened to Rodney King, 1991, there was this another riot that we got hurt. A lot of people stood up. The Me Too movement stood up. The Armenian genocide, 10,000 people go and march and there is not anything happening. But why this? Why, how can we be heard without being listened to? America needs to address generational racism. America needs to address generational racism. Um, I can give you a perfect example. Uh, going back to being a police officer, um, I had a particular sergeant, uh, and uh, we ended up being on good terms right before we, I left. So I don't want to speak badly of his name, but you know we had we had that talk finally. But anyway, uh, this guy rode me for my entire career. I never worked with this guy. Never worked with him. He worked in a completely different bureau for me. I worked in patrol. This person worked completely opposite me. But whenever he had a chance to get rid of me for something, he would. And I'd mm. sit there and, you know, what's going on with this guy, you know? And then uh, finally I had another sergeant and he came up to me and said, hey, gee, you need to be careful of this guy over here. I had to check him. Another sergeant went and checked another sergeant like, hey, if you got a problem, my guy, come get me, you know, but don't do what you're doing. You're, you're disrespecting this man. I don't like what you're doing. He's my guy type thing. Uh, anyway, uh, this particular sergeant uh, pulled me aside uh, who checked the other sergeant and he told me a story and he says, Tyrone, I know this guy since we were, you know, kids. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah. He goes, uh, his dad had literally a whole room that was a shrine to Hitler. Mm. Okay. So I was like, well, that might make sense why the guy <laughs> didn't like me. <laughs> and always try to get me in trouble at work. And so I spent my whole career dealing with this person. And, you know, and there it was somebody who knew him, I guess, from his childhood said, hey, this guy was raised with a father who had a shrine to Hitler. Okay, so how is this guy supposed to grow up a normal human being, loving a person with melanin skin, irregardless of the fact that I'm biracial or what, you know, a person with melanin skin because his father has infected his brain, his spirit, his psyche, and said, any person of that sort is the lesser kind, not worthy, you know? Mm. So that's, that's, that's what we're dealing with right now. And until we can get rid of that, you know, uh, nothing is going to work. But LBJ said, you know, uh, you know, I can't remember the direct quote, you know, uh, make any white man, uh, uh, feel uh, smarter or better than the, the you know, the, or make a, the dumbest a white man feel smarter than a, the, the, the uh, better than the smartest black man, you know, he'll give you like the last dime out of his pocket type thing, basically saying, you know, if you can make that white man feel better than that black man, that's all we need. And that's what we're dealing with right now. It's just hate. And uh, like I said, I, I'm on both sides of the fence. I, I, I can't hate white people. I can't hate black people. I've dealt with black racism, racism in my life, you know, being, you know, half white. Yeah, you know, so being half white, you know, I was down there in the hood at school, so, you know, I was half breed and all that stuff. So I know that side too. So, but uh, in house, as far as uh, white people, that's the first thing I could say is uh, uh, at home, stop teaching your kids to hate them. Stop te teaching your kids to hate. 
you know, um, children, when they are born, the, uh, the first two things that it's a natural thing for a child is one is a cry and which is calling to come and nurture me, care, care for me, feed me, and their joy and laughter. And it doesn't matter because that joy and laughter does not segregate. I think everything is a learned behavior. It comes from what I call it herb, which is the H for habits that we have. Uh, the E is our environment our surroundings, where we grow up, what we heard, because children are sponges. Just like when you say at five years old, that's what your grandmother, she shared that information with you and it has stuck with you. And it goes to our core. It goes to our essence of every cell and every DNA. So I myself, I'm biracial and most people did not know that. So when it comes to Persian and Armenian, at when I was, when my parents were getting married, that was a wrong thing for a Christian to marry a Muslim, even though my dad was the least of a Muslim, but he became Catholic to marry my mom. But I grew up having both. So, and I understand it because mine is either my accent or the way I speak, or I'm not American enough, Armenian enough, Persian enough, or anything enough. And we grow up as a child thinking, I'm not good enough. So, and especially when we put color. And uh, yesterday I was in networking when Tim Ballard, who is now the CEO of the human trafficking, and he is helping out. It's like, it's power and greed overcoming everything else but how do we heal with it what is the first thing you believe we can teach our audience here to start the belief of how do we heal what resources it starts with each one of us our our, our personal change we mm. have to be we have to be the change okay within ourselves be it the white person that, as uh, as I uh, spoke on earlier, who was uh, brought up to hate, okay? You have to acknowledge your faults and be the change to make the difference. Stand up, put on your big boy, big girl pants and say, I have to change. Mm -hmm. And it goes the same thing with, uh, with black folks, you know. Uh, we have, are always given a poor representation in the media. Little is seen of all the good things that we do. Okay, but greatly is seen all the bad things that we do. Hence, you know, uh, the media coverage of robberies and carjackings and, you know, the high speed chases and, you know, the shootings and stuff like that. You know, so what I ask of uh, my people, especially of the young, younger people, is to be the change within yourself. Okay. I, I you know, I come from a homeless background. I could have uh, given up and I could have, you know, I, I remember. Uh, years ago, and I can't believe what I'm telling you, but I will tell you this. I had a friend who uh, who uh, had another friend, and he sat up there. And next thing you know, I'm sitting in a, a this lounge, and the guy opens up a briefcase, and there's like two kilos of cocaine sitting in there. And I was just like going. Now the the person in the hood, the Detroit Tyrone, was sitting there going. I can make some serious money off of this, you know, mm. but the good Tyrone, and that's what I, the point I'm getting at, you know, what I want for people is to find the good person in you. And I remember looking at that guy and I said, if I did disrespect my father like this, and that would be like the worst thing I could think of. I remember closing the suitcase, closing the latches. I remember sliding those two big old bags of cocaine back over, over to him. I looked at my friend, I was like, I can't even believe you even called me to this man. I go, get me out of here. And I, I got up from the table and I walked away. In the same sense, the people in the projects and in the hood and stuff like that, rather than falling for the, the dumb stuff, so to speak, you know, you know, challenge yourself and be a change, go to school. You know, it's a long road, but do that. In my case, I wanted to go to school. I couldn't 
because of certain, you know, things that happen, you know, parents passing on and stuff like that early on. But I fought and I fought for my homeless, you know, beginnings. And I, I worked my way up from nothing. And, you know, like I said, I don't have the best lives, but, you know, from nothing, I've got a halfway decent life. So be the change is what I'm saying. Work for life, you know, life's not going to give you nothing. You know, exactly. you have to work for it. And that's exactly. what's happening right there. A lot of people are angry down there. We, you know, we're in the midst of all this COVID-19 stuff, even though it's kind of blown away with the whole riot thing. But uh, there's a lot of anger and tension right th down there right now. But uh, I think um, anger can be quelled with accomplishments. You know what I mean? Imagine, uh, you know, how a person feels when they've done something good in their lives rather than something bad in their lives. That's what my people need to do. And I understand I my way up and be quelled. So 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 true because i mean it, it's not i don't think the cocaine thing i mean i command you i take your uh, my hat off to you i it uh, reminded me when i used to do plain clothes at may company and uh, i was a plain clothes uh, investigator at that time when after work we would go and my boss and his group they would just line it up and everything one day they i was standing there um, beer in my hand and they said you want to do a line and i said well you know what when i was in junior high school um my teacher taught me one thing you're already happy you don't need to be happier and i just looked <laughs> and i said i don't need it because i'm already happy and but there was it, you know, I, I don't think that taking that kind of an opportunity in everything, because when Kobe passed, uh, there was no color. I mean, everyone was crying. Everyone was devastated, you know, and everyone came together, the flowers, the uh, every, it, it, there was, I mean, from basketball players, from non-basketball players, from, and it was not only for Kobe, it was for all nine passengers, but Kobe because of his status. And you've been a bodyguard for so many celebrities and dignitaries. How does your life uh, get, I mean, do you do that as a job or is it the person? And the only reason I'm asking is when you are hired as a bodyguard, are you hired for that person or uh, you are hired as a position? Do you have a choice who you work with? Uh, yeah, most of the time you do. Uh, you, uh, right now, I'm not doing a lot of that work. Uh, it's mm. just. Uh, I know you're doing I, a lot of gardening uh, and everything. <laughs> no, I, I I did that uh, for oh, geez, over you know a decade and a half, maybe even like like 20 years there, and a lot of clientele and stuff. And what what it was is uh you you know I, I worked with a person that uh, was uh, involved in the media directly, and I ended up working for the. Uh, largest entertainment uh, management company in the world. And that's how I got all the contact. So I ended up doing a lot of bodyguard for work, work for them. And then also, you know, dealing with all these, uh, uh, like working for the police department and stuff like that. I got a lot of the dignitary jobs. You've got to, uh, Correct. Uh, you got a lot of handoffs, I guess you would call it. So, but, uh, but you know, uh, that that's how it all started basically. It was just handoffs and, uh, and then word of mouth and then one person likes you and they get another call and that sort of thing so well i know from my friends once a police officer always a police officer when folks find out that you were a police officer do they treat you differently i it, you know I, I it is strange a few relationships along the way <laughs> you know you're a police officer you know what i mean so uh yeah, gun toting, uh, badge having type thing, and uh, people feel uncomfortable about that. So I, mm. I had to deal with that a, a lot, a lot along the way, and lost some friends and stuff. But you know, because that, they're getting that's... a lot of bad rap too. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I love police officers, man. I, you know, I've, 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 I've had bad experiences with them, but I've also had ex extremely great experiences with them. So and I know because I, I worked there uh, what, uh, almost 25 years in the city of Columbia. And uh, what, 
you'd say like 98, 99% of those people are going out there every day with the right intentions, wanting to help people, serve people, and uh, the bottom line, willing to risk their life to help exactly. those people. You know what I mean? And that's what and is happening right now. Yeah. I, you know, I, I remember being a, a police officer. I was uh, actually uh, involved in a, a custody death where uh, um, I knew this person and uh, he had, he had a, a substance abuse problem. I had actually arrested him uh, prior on a substance abuse uh, issue. And then uh, here it was six months later and we got a call to his residence and, you know, he's high and, you know, uh, mm -hmm. acting all erratic and stuff. And we ended up getting him to the jail. But uh, by the time we got him to the jail, he ended up getting so crazy that he needed to be transferred to the hospital. And um, there was a new officer there that was there. And, uh, you know, he was uh, hyped up about the situation because the guy is like 6'2", the guy that was in question, kind of a girthy person. And this guy's thinking he's going to be in danger, but the guy's, you know, handcuffed. And you know, while the guy's riding around and I'm calling him by the name, you know, Officer gave him a couple shots to the rib cage, and I'm like, you know, hold on, man, <laughs> you know, stop right there, you know, this is not the time to be agitating this person. He's like, he's he's stoned out of his mind right now. He has no idea where he is, and you just gave him two shots to the rib. How is this going to help the situation right now? And uh, you know, the guy is fighting, and we we got him calmed down, and he kept going and going and going, and finally, the guy had a heart attack right there, oh. you know. You know, and I'm standing over him, and you know, can you imagine? I remember, uh, you know, I literally saw his pupils dilate right before me, so I know that feeling, uh, you know, that those officers went through. But in in our case, you know, absent, you know, that young officer making a mistake, but that that had no effect on it. This guy was really high. He's a little bit uh, overweight and stuff like that. And then the way he was struggling, uh, you know, his heart finally, I guess, exploded literally. So. Um, yeah, so I've experienced that. So uh, you don't want to be in that situation. And uh, like, in, you know, our situation worked out favorably. On the other hand, with yeah. uh, uh, Mr. Floyd in question, that was poor tactics and, and tragic. Of course. Ended. Yes. And not only poor tactics, but he's literally watching the video being videoed. And didn't we learn that wasn't it only in february that the there was another uh black guy who was shot from the back because they said yeah. he was looting a an empty house so well, uh, street justice again yeah they, i believe yes. they actually were uh, uh they were in court today uh on their uh, case all three of them uh, the father the, the son yeah, the one the father, I believe, is a retired police officer of all things. Yes. And then and then his son. So think about it. Where I was speaking to uh, uh, speaking of earlier, generational racism. So, you know, something's it's, going on. It's with a that learned behavior. Officer. Yeah, exactly. And then the person, I don't know who, I think it might have been the person videotaping them, you know, uh, I think they were also arrested too, because that was just very odd that the person behind them had this this prime shot of this guy, you know, jogging, and then all of a sudden. They hop out and, you know, there's a shotgun in the guy's chest. So I don't know all the details of all that. And I don't know what the kid did. But the bottom line is there's no room for street vigilantes anywhere in the United States. Mm -hmm. of America. If you got a problem with Bounty person, hunters. Yeah, you, you call the police. That's what we get paid to do. And the police could easily came out. He said, you know what? He went that away. And he's wearing, a, you know, tan khaki pants and a white shirt and, you know, white running shoes. He went that away. Police, you know coordinate next you know the guy gets stopped and you fi him you know field or interview him and uh you know find out what's going on in this case they took it upon themselves to be street vigilantes and uh if somebody walked up with to me with a shotgun i would react in a way where i'm going to de defend myself i'm going to try to get the muzzle of that barrel away from any part of my torso or my body redirect it to open area or if i can redirect it back to him so that that fire is going back at him that's what that kid was doing he was fighting mm. for his life. And so this guy says, hey, you didn't do what I do. I'm a street vigilante with a shotgun. And so, hey, wait a minute, you're struggling with me? I have the right to kill you. Boom. And that was his justification. And that's why him and his son and the other guy with the video camera are sitting there on murder charges right now. And I think what happened to 
Floyd also, the officers are going to get the same thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's a, it's a sad situation. They had, had every opportunity to uh, get up Let go. off of him. And, and I found out that the that the Chauvin, I guess, is a 20 plus year veteran. So he knows better. Okay, so he's got, he, he, from the get go, he's had some issues. I guess he's had like 17 uh, personnel complaints about uh, excessive force or whatever, maybe some sort of citations for wrongdoings. And then the other guys were, I guess, for all less than a year on. So they're looking at the senior guy with the knee in the neck as the example, okay? And here we are, we got all these, we call them boots, you know, looking at the guy fresh off of probation going, you know, we better listen what do to what I he do? said. Yeah, and so they kind of, he, they followed suit. And uh, you know, I would have been the guy, if I see this guy choking out saying I can't breathe and we're what, you know, a few years removed from the other incident where the guy uh, got choked out, Eric Garner, and he's saying the same thing. I mean, that's right. a motif statement for a dying black man that you don't want to hear. I can't breathe. He's saying it right there in broad daylight on video. <laughs> and for and I, I don't mean to laugh. It's just it's so it's comical. It's obvious. It yeah. Yes. And uh, for the better part of nine minutes, they uh, restricted his ability to breathe with their body weight. And then that one guy, that Chauvin, with his hands in his pocket, that was not good at all for law enforcement. Right. And no one comes to stop. No one comes to do anything. It's like it, what happens in real life, it's the uh, flight and fight, but there's also the freeze point. And it's like people go into freeze, but they have the cameras going on. And that's the part that most people don't understand the adrenaline that in, it starts hitting. I mean, it's like the rookies who are watching, not knowing what to do. It's like a shock system because we don't believe this is happening in real life. And I don't think, although this is happening, I, please correct me if I'm wrong. It's not only black, it's happening in so many different uh, colors, races, religions, everything is happening. It's just, I think everything is coming to a boil. Mm, that, that, that's where we're at right now. And you know, we, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a nonpartisan. I'm, <laughs> I, I vote Republican and I vote Democrats, so let me preface that. But uh, we, we have a, a person I think that's in charge right now that's uh, not fulfilling the fullest obligations. Uh, and the finest obligations of, of the office that he holds. And uh, as far as setting an example of a, of a, of a wholesome uh, coming together, uh, we have- You mean a, leadership? A, yeah, leadership. We have, a, we have an environment of a, that is uh, divisive and separating, and it's all, uh, I guess, you, like, panning or playing to his base right now. We have an election year coming up here in November in just a few months. So. Um, the tactics that he's using, I can understand why he's doing because he's trying to get those votes and stuff, but we're at the tail end of a pandemic. Everybody's been cooped up for a couple months and then we've got a couple of brothers. A lot who, of angers. You know, yeah, you know what I mean? And all of a sudden we got a flashpoint happening. We got yeah. several major cities in the United States of America that are on fire, being looted and vandalized, okay? But it's not only America. Have you seen? It's now becoming global, just like yeah, the yeah, yeah. virus. It's becoming global. But but I, I'm sp I'm speaking on America in particular. Right. So what, 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 we've got all this going on, and uh, I, I I would have thought a true leader would have addressed the issue at hand. Mm. And he spoke on it in the first couple of days with you know answering, responding to the question by uh, like say a reporter. But he didn't. Uh, take the opportunity to address America. I mean, literally sit in front of the camera and say, look, you know. Calm. Exactly, he did not do it. Rather, what he did is he went out there and he, he made a brief statement about the issue. And then, right. a, and he spoke on the force that he would use to uh, quell the, uh, the uprising because of the issue. So I don't, I, I don't see how America is going to be bettered with this person in office. That's, that's how it is. And I, I, I want to support the president of the United States. 
I love America. I've been here for almost 60 years, okay? I love America, but I'm not gonna support somebody that does not support the all of America, the whole of America. Not, you know, part of America is not America, okay? We have Thank to support you. the whole of America. And that's, you know, that's the only issue that I have right now and his representation thereof. And you know, his, uh, what's his name? Uh, George Floyd's uh, funeral services are going on as we speak right now. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, they're going on well, right now. Nobody from the United States, uh, you know, president's administration is there. Nobody's there. You know, where's the vice president at? You know, somebody to show up and say, you know what, we, we give a damn, so to speak. That's just a poor example. But I think uh, come November, you know, there's going to uh, there's going to be a strong stance uh, towards uh, the wrong that we've been directed in, and I don't mean to speak ill of the president. I'm just saying uh, I'm speaking what I've been seeing the last three years. Okay, and I'm using a reasonable person's doctrine uh, from what I've seen. Okay, and if it was good, I would be saying good. Okay. I hear you. Well. We come to a point, I unfortunately, something is going on with my feed and I cannot see if there is any questions, if there is any comments and oh. I cannot open my phone because if I open my phone, then we will go into <laughs> double, a double and I've had that double going on and I don't want to escape. So if there are any uh, viewers who are making comments. If you see it, by all means, can you respond to it? Because I am totally blind to where we are. Do you see any comments? Do you see any questions? I don't see anything up there. Well, I, I, it's kind of hard for me to see it. At, at okay, <laughs> so we are in that position. Whoever is watching, I thank you for being here. Um, I thank you, Ty for on the whim saying yes, yes for showing up. And just like my motto, what I say is let us show up and stand up, not only for ourselves, but for us as a we, because we heal within is my message. It Everything starts from inside. We have to take that responsibility to, instead of blaming, our heritage, blaming where we come from, blaming just pure and essence of blame, either from leadership to everything. Healing becomes from the inside, from our home, from educating ourselves, educating our children and understanding. We can have a dialogue of just hearing another side and it doesn't mean that we have to accept it but we have to be willing to hear the other party and with that prayers and thoughts for his life and the lives of many who feel that they are not heard and not seen and with that i thank you ty i am blessed for having you in my life from the day you were sat behind me and you were <laughs> guarding me to this very moment. Uh, thank, thank you, you my friend. It's been a pleasure, I appreciate it. All right, so for all of you, thank you for being here. God bless you and may the universal light surround you. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.